Thank you. <clears throat> I'm mic'd up for the video, but I'm not mic'd up for in here. Can everyone hear me well enough in the back? Okay. If you can't, let me know and I'll, I'll turn this thing on. Uh, excited to be here, excited to kick off the speaker series. Um, I have spoken to groups before and conferences about male journalists, well, journalists in general, about World War I, but I've never spoken to anyone about women journalists in World War I. So you people are my guinea pigs. <laughs> so um, I did write a book about women journalists that'll be out this fall. And in the introduction to that book, I, I warned the readers that it takes a little bit of mental adjustment to get your head around the concept of women war correspondence in this time period. So you, you have to have a, a, list, a passing familiarity with women in the profession of journalism at this time and a little bit, know a little bit about what war corresponding involved in the First World War and the, and the decades immediately before it. So I'm, I'm going to cover a little bit of that very quickly. Uh, but let me start here, if I can figure out how to operate this thing. And, and obviously I can't. Oh, there, okay. How I got here. I, I really occupy a very narrow sliver of scholarship on the Great War, <laughs> journalism. Uh, so these are the three books I've published before about the war. And uh, so I didn't start off in journalism. I, someone told me that there was a World War I German submarine at the bottom of Lake Michigan. And I figured, how the hell did that happen? You know, Come down the St. Lawrence Seaway to attack shipping? Anyway, I had to get to the bottom of that. So it, it was one of the surrender U-boats that the U.S. acquired after the war. And it, it did a tour throughout the Great Lakes. It stopped in Erie in June 1919. But anyway, I, I wrote a book about that. And there wasn't much historical record about that. I found myself relying on old newspaper and magazine accounts of that. And I, it just grabbed hold of me. I just became fascinated by that way of telling about the war. I mean, the same way the American public learned about the war. They read about it in their newspapers. So that led me to the second book here about journalists in World War I. And then I just co-edited uh, an anthology of articles that sort of follow the period of American involvement in the war. But it was why, while writing those last two that I, I realized that I had shortchanged women. <laughs> uh, I mentioned them in that middle book, about a half a dozen of them. But in the course of writing those two and in putting the anthology together, I realized that their contribution was so much greater than I realized, and I really wanted to make a historical record of that. So let's take a quick look at women in journalism at this time. <coughs> a couple of the, those who stand out. Probably the only journalist from the 19th century that any of you have ever heard of, other than Ida Tarbell, um, is Nellie Bly. Uh, so in 1889, she, she's working for the New York World, and she, well, her editors decide, hey, we're going to send you around the world. Jules Verne had just written the famous novel Around the World in 80 Days. And the editors say, why don't you see if you can beat the record of Jules Verne and go around the world in less than 80 days? And this was a period when railroads were spanning the globe and steamships were there and uh, the Panama Canal had opened. So they thought she could do it. And damned if she didn't. <laughs> she did it in 72 days. And the New York world made such a big production of this. I mean, they followed her at every step along the way. She went over to London, went to France, met Jules Verne, uh, continued to Italy, went through the Panama Canal, over India. And, and, and there's all kinds of mysteries, whether she's going to catch this steamer or not. Will she get behind? Oh, there's a typhoon in, off the, the, in the South Pacific. Uh, and she finally did it. And she literally became an international celebrity. As a matter of fact, here we go. Just this year, they came out. Well, one of the things she, she did beyond going around the world in 80 days, she practiced uh, a type of journalism called, in those days, stunt journalism. I don't know, we might call it investigative journalism. But one of her big stunts, well, let me back up here, um, she pretended she was insane and had herself committed to Blackwell's uh, lunatic asylum in New York City and spent 10 days in there and wrote an expose of how they treated the patients. And, 
And uh, that's what this made-for-TV movie that just came out this year is about. Um, I haven't seen it. I can't recommend it, but it uh, looks pretty dramatic. Uh, since I was coming to oil country, I, I thought I'd better throw in Ida Tarbell here. Because um, there were a, not a lot of really prominent women journalists in the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s. Um, Tarbell certainly became one <coughs> um, when her articles, I mean, she's as much a historian as a journalist. Um, but so she is becoming popular at the decade or so after uh, Nellie Bly. The same year um, she published her famous book about Standard Oil, 1904, I found this photo I wanted to throw in here, same time. This is a bunch of Canadian journalists, women journalists, who were traveling to St. Louis for the 1904 World's Fair. And uh, I put this up here. Hey, I got to try my laser pointer here. Uh, not to show you these women journalists so much as to show you these three guys here, these are chaperones. <laughs> you didn't send a bunch of women <laughs> out into the world, just like you sent, wouldn't send a bunch of kids out into the world, but on their own. You didn't send a bunch of women out into the world without three burly gentlemen to uh, chaperone them all over the place. So that's what these women in 1904 were dealing with. Um, but most of the time, women in journalism this time, this is what they did for newspapers. So this is the opening decade or so of the 20th century, and the woman's page had dawned. So when a, a woman went to apply for a job in a newspaper, great, you can work on the women's page. <laughs> yeah. and, and you see the thing, there's all kinds of, here's a efficient housekeeping, uh, oops, I'm pointing the wrong thing, efficient housekeeping tips here, and uh, society uh, pages, um, what else? Here's a suffrage article, is universal suffrage, women couldn't vote, of course, in, in this, these years. Um, so, interesting thing, but this was all the news about women, by women, typically ended up on the women's page. And you didn't find a woman who was, again, typically, uh, on the staff of a newspaper other than this. And a lot of these women didn't work at the newspaper, but they worked by correspondence. They sent in their articles and things like that. Um, okay, now about war corresponding. <coughs> so, when the First World War started in 1914, these were the two most famous war correspondents in America, Richard Harding Davis and Frederick Palmer. They had both covered five wars prior to the First World War. And and interesting to know is about Frederick Palmer. He was from right up over the hill here, Pleasantville. Oh, yeah? Yes. Oh, geez, okay. Um, they um, had both covered five wars before. Harding Davis became famous for covering the uh, Spanish-American War. And typically, when you covered a war, you, now we would call we, uh, uh, you were embedded with the military. So he traveled with the American forces in Cuba when they were during the Spanish-American War. Uh, actually took a couple shots at Spanish soldiers, took the surrender of a town, uh, and traveled with the Rough Riders. As a matter of fact, it was his coverage of the Rough Riders that brought some fame to Teddy Roosevelt and sort of helped him get into the White House. Um, so they covered Spanish-American War, the Philippine Insurrection, the Boer War, the uh, Russo-Japanese War, 1905. The, there was, every year there was a war in the Baltic states as the Ottoman Empire was being pushed out of Europe. Um, so everywhere they went, and they just became part of the army. They were accredited to the army and traveled with them. And, and Palmer missed the um, Spanish-American War because he was up in the Yukon covering the, the gold rush up there. But real adventurous sort of hard-boiled kind of thing. So when the war began, we've lost my clicker. Um, when the war began, he, it's natural, of course, that they would send the most famous war correspondents to Europe. This is the start of the war. Um, this is the first month of the war, right up to the Battle of the Marne. So Germany comes in through Belgium, gets within 40 miles of Paris before they're stopped, they're pushed back, and here's where they dig in. And for the next four years, this is where the war happens. 
between the 400 miles between the North Sea and Switzerland. Uh, th this is where the trenches were. Uh, but in the opening days of the war, when Harding Davis is going over there, he, in the first days, he ends up in London, and n none of the belligerents would uh, accredit journalists. They were not allowed into the war zone. So you couldn't do anything from London where he was. If you went to Paris, the Frenchmen led you over here. They were arresting any journalists who tried to get into the war zone. But civilians could still travel to Brussels. And since this is where all the action was, that's where they went. So Richard Harding Davis and a handful of other journalists, not Palmer, but went over to Brussels, ended up there in about August 15th, about two weeks into the war. And who should they meet when they get there? Mary Boyle O'Reilly. She beat him there. <laughs> Mary Boyle O'Reilly was kind of a unique figure. I mean, at a time when women did not have a good foothold in the journalist profession, she was the London bureau chief, chief of a syndicated news service on, on the s sort of like Associated Press or United Press. Uh, those were the major news services, though, and, and they, they did spot news. I mean, anything, anytime any news happened anywhere, they wrote it up, cabled it back to America, and within hours it could be in some Midwestern newspaper. Uh, newspaper Enterprise Association wrote mostly features, a lot of women's page features. Uh, interviews with royalty were big. Um, trials, if a woman murdered her husband or a husband murdered his wife. <laughs> Those were always covered. Those went on the women's page. Uh, so I, I just put her here with uh, Davis and Palmer again, just so you can begin to get your head around this. <laughs> it, it's, she's, she's not a war correspondent. She doesn't have that kind of reputation. However, she does a great job. Um, so here's what happens in the beginning of the war. The German advance is held up around the fortified city of Liege here. They had to wait till they brought out their giant siege guns so they could pulverize the forts there. And uh, <coughs> so the journalists who are in Brussels, the men rent taxis and hire cars and go out here looking for the big battle. The French army is coming up here, the British army is coming here, the German army was coming the other direction. Everyone expected some climactic battle that's gonna end the war, uh, and it, it doesn't happen. Um, so the men go out here and they, the cavalry, German cavalry is coming in here. There's a lot of little skirmishes and they get to see some of that. Mostly the Belgian army is getting clobbered. Um, and pretty soon the, the fort gets pulverized here and the Germans march and uh, Brussels surrenders around the 22nd of August. And so the journalists are trapped here and the mails aren't working. The cables, the cables been cut and um, they can't circulate, so they can't do their job, so they decide to leave. The Germans are only too happy to let them leave, so they put them on a train. They're gonna send them on a train to Aachen in Germany here, where they'll get another train up to Neutral Holland, and then they can be, get back to England. So under typical circumstances, this takes a couple hours to travel from Brussels to Aachen. On this occasion, it took 26 hours and the reason is because all the war traffic was going in the other direction. All the, the Germans, uh, soldiers and artillery and supplies. And so every couple hours, their train had to pull into a siding somewhere and wait till the war traffic went through and it could get back on the track and continue its journey. And uh, <coughs> so that's what happened at the town of Louvain, a university city. And it happened to pull in there exactly when the German army was destroying the town of Louvain. Um, the Germans claimed that the civilians fired at their soldiers. And so in retribution, they were destroying the town. They had already murdered the mayor and the uh, president of the university. They were in the process of burning the university library. It held a collection of mi priceless medieval manuscripts. They were going door to door and bombing and burning the houses. And all the, pe the journalists had to stay on the train. All the people were coming from their homes and collecting at the train station where the Germans were, and men were selected out of there for retribution execution 
marched off and shot on the side. And these journalists who had been looking to find the war found the war. So what happens? They get over here, they go up to Neutral Holland, all the men rush back to London to file their stories. Richard Harding Davis is the first <laughs> to get his story on a cable back to America. Except Mary, By Mary Boyle O'Reilly. She decides, this is the biggest story of the war so far, biggest story of her career, and she decides, I'm going to go back to Louvain to get the rest of the story. So she finds some guy in Holland brave enough to drive her back there. And she first drives down here to Liege, and uh, she finds on a railroad siding there thousands of women and children locked into railroad cars. The, they're women and children from Louvain. And the Germans are sending them back to Germany, and they don't know where they're being sent or what's going to happen to them. So she helps some Red Cross workers give them food and water. Then she continues on her way to Louvain, and she gets back there, and the Germans are still bombing and burning the houses. She finds bodies laid out along the streets, including women with gray hair, she says. Uh, so <sighs> she's got her story. What she does next, she uh, um, abandons her automobile. There's all kinds of refugees on the road here, and they're all headed up to Neutral Holland, where they hope to be safe, and she joins them. So she spends several days marching up here, going past all these other destroyed towns and collecting stories from them and uh, finding old men hanging from trees and priests telling her what happened in these towns. And she finally makes it to Holland and she begins to write her story. My pointer disappears on me all the time. I better keep it in my hand. Um, so suddenly, Newspapers is a syndicated news service, so they have hundreds of subscribing newspapers in America. And so suddenly, hundreds of newspapers have Boyle, Mary Boyle O'Reilly's uh, headlines on them. And it's not on the women's page where her stories typically ended up, it's on the front page. So Mary Boyle O'Reilly makes a big splash early in the war, becomes one of the most popular uh, writers. <coughs> so I'm jumping ahead one year, this is one year into the war. And this is an article that appeared in the uh, New York Tribune pointing out the fact that there was one magazine in America that in the first year sent four women to cover the war. And, and this was pretty remarkable. And the magazine was the, oops, the magazine was the Saturday Evening Post. Let's see here. Um, the, here's the list of the women. One was sent to Russia. Russia did the curious thing of the day it went into the war, it declared prohibition. Since the government was the, had a monopoly on the production and sale of vodka, they could do this. <laughs> it was pretty easy. Uh, and this was, since this was a, such a hot issue in the United States too, I mean, several states had already gone dry and the temperance movement was gathering steam, so America was moving towards prohibition itself. So they said, hey, go over there and find out <laughs> how it's going on in Russia and see what they're doing. Uh, Maud Radford uh, Warren was a Chicago journalist who had been born in Canada. So America thought it was safe 3,000 miles away from the war, but our neighbor right next door, Canada, was mobilizing for the war. As, as one of the Commonwealth nations, they were with Britain in, in the war. So she went up there and talked about how Canada was mobilizing for the war. But the two I, I'd want to talk about tonight are Cora Harris and uh, Mary Roberts Reinhardt. Um, before I do, though, these, same, these two articles appeared on that same page I just showed you. This one's by Ida Tarbell. <laughs> and this one is a regular feature that appeared on that page, Are Women People? <laughs> so, a word or two about the Saturday Evening Post, because they were so influential in war reporting um, because of this guy. George Lorimer. He took over Saturday Evening Post in, I think, 1905, when they had a circulation of 1,500. And when the war started in 1914, they had a circulation of 2 million. 2 million weekly readers. And uh, they did it by, it was originally seen as a men's magazine, but they started expanding this. They, they wanted to get more women readers, and so they started hiring women 
uh, report, or not reporters, uh, journalists, freelancers. Um, they hired their first woman editor in 1909, so they really started uh, getting a lot of women. <coughs> and one of the reasons they did want to do this, because advertisers realized that women made a lot of purchase decisions. <laughs> advertisers wanted to reach women. So you see the sort of thing, things for the home, food, this is a pretty bold one here. They're selling newspaper tires and they're having, advertising that to women. That's pretty bold for 1914. Uh, but if you want to reach women readers, you better deliver content that women readers want to read. So they were sending women to war. So here's Cora Harris. Cora Harris goes over in the fall of 1914, a couple months into the war, and begins to really turn the narrative about women in the war. So if you went over there at this time, you saw a lot of women in mourning, wearing black, because they had lost a loved one in the war. Um, and so she, she writes about that, what women were the unsung victims of war. But she went over there and <sighs> she went in London, she met the volunteer organization that had formed in the first days of the war. And they just seemed to be doing so much more than the government itself. She helped them uh, welcome train loads of Belgian refugees that were coming over. This is an organization of like 150,000 women that had sprung into existence in the opening days of the war in London. And they were opening up hospitals in France and sending surgeons to Serbia. <laughs> they were doing, they were, seemed to be so much more active than things. So she, she changes the narrative by saying that women aren't just victims of this war. They are that, and, and we don't see that enough, but they are active participants in the war. They have a role as important as men in the war. Men are fighting in the war and dying in the war, but women are doing all this background stuff as well. She went over to France and she uh, tried to get up to the front. It was still impossible to do that, but she did find a woman over there who had stood up to the Germans when they came into her town and saved some of the community and, and now was running a hospital that was right up by the firing zone and taking artillery attacks all the time. And she sort of portrays her as her Joan of Arc, you know, standing up, <laughs> the, the strong women of France, you know. So it's, uh, but she starts to change that narrative. Mary Roberts Reinhardt, some of you may have heard of her. She was an enormously popular uh, novelist in this this period. She was a local girl. Is that she, pardon? She was from Sewickley. Yes. Yeah. Um, and um, I could spend the entire night talking about what happened to Mary Roberts right here. So I'm going to stretch it out a little bit. Um, the, um, she went over there in the spring of 1915, uh, still couldn't get to the front. So she arrives in London, tries to get the British to give her some credentials to take her to the, the war zone. Can't do it. The French won't do it. Uh, she happened to be a trained nurse. So someone suggested to her, why don't you go to the Belgian Red Cross? They have an office here in London. And ask them if you can go and visit some of the hospitals in France and Belgium where the soldiers are. And so she does that. And, and here's her pitch. She, she tells them, you know, America's doing a lot for France and uh, uh, England already. We're sending a lot of humanitarian aid over here. We're feeding the starving people of Belgium. You know, an American engineer had started uh, the relief of Belgium campaign to feed them a guy named Herbert Hoover. Um, so we're, America's already doing a heck of a lot for, and yet we don't know what's going on over here. We don't know the kind of sacrifices Belgium is making and what you need, let me tell your story to the two million readers of Reader's Digest, uh, Reader's Digest, Saturday and Post, and, uh, and that will help you, uh, help Americans become engaged in the war and continue their support. And they bought it hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> they said it was, it was really a turning point in the war. The governments were starting to figure out less that they should suppress the news rather than they should manage it for their advantage. Um, so that was just happening. So she gets put up in Calais, and every day she goes out and visits a hospital, and every night they take her to the front 
to the trenches under cover of darkness. One night, she, and she has a, a journal she keeps every night when she gets back to her t hotel in Calais. And uh, so this is just one page from it. She gets home and she discovers 48 bombs have been dropped on Calais while I was away today. And ki they're killing women and children. You know, this is terrorism. This is trying to break the morale. This is uh, killing non-combatants. Um, so the Germans were using airplanes and zeppelins dirigibles to bomb France and London. Um, so <coughs> she has so many wonderful stories. She, she published about a dozen articles in Saturday Evening Post in the spring and summer of 1915. And <coughs> lots of wonderful stories, and I'd like to tell you a bunch of them, but let me just throw out a couple. She has a <laughs> nice story. She visits a hospital over there and tells you how what a high level they operated at. And she watches one surgeon uh, operate on a Belgian soldier who had a head wound. And within minutes, he had cut it open, extracted the piece of shrapnel, and dropped it on into Mary Robert Reinhardt's hand. And she kept that as a, a souvenir of her, of her trip. But th that's the kind of personal touch she brought to this thing. It lets you visualize this kind of thing. These are the people she interviewed. She was only <laughs> with her for three months. They, this is the king and queen of Belgium, the queen of England, Winston Churchill, who was the first lord of the admiralty at that time, uh, the leaders of the British and French armies. No one had <laughs> interviewed them yet. And Mary Roberts Reinhardt did this. It was really extraordinary. Um, just one final story about her. It's, she. Um, was over at an airfield, British airfield near Ypres, and uh, she met two British women uh, some no from the nobility who were working way up near the trenches. They helped, they went into the trenches and stayed with the wounded soldiers until the ambulance could come and take them off the field. And they said, why don't you come and come over to our house for tea tonight? And so she said, okay. <laughs> so the, the, the women went away, went back to their house, and. The, Mary Roberts Reinhardt was driven over there that night by some British officers. You had to go to, every time you're going to the front, you had to go at night. And um, the roads were muddy and shell pocked, and uh, they constantly had to pull over again to let war traffic through. And finally, they pulled over and slipped into a ditch. And they were still miles away. And uh, even passing soldiers tried to pull them out, and they couldn't do it. So Mary Roberts Reinhardt was going to tea. She had worn her fur, high-heeled shoes. She steps out of this car and sinks up to her knees in mud. <laughs> and she has to walk two miles yet to these, the house of these women. And she goes there and uh, has her tea and gets her story. And, uh, but anyway, a wonderful war correspondent. <laughs> Nothing stopped her. Let me jump ahead a year, 1916. This is when things started changing. W publications were sending women over there to get the woman's perspective on the war. And generally that meant what was going on the home front, what was happening with women and children on the home front. So Mabel Potter Daggett goes over there and she goes to one of the suffrage organizations in London. And these, these organizations used to keep files on women who did something exceptional. So that might be a woman who earns a, an advanced degree at a university or runs a business on her own or wins an athletic competition or the tugboat captain, anything. <laughs> so they'd, they'd clip it out of the newspaper and put it in the file. When World War I came, these files exploded because women were doing in all kinds of exceptional things. Everyone knew about the women working in the munitions factories. Hundreds of thousands of women in Germany and France and England worked in these factories. She visits a factory in, in London, in outside London and uh, sees these women working on monstrous hydraulic presses, stamping out these artillery shells. And here's where it starts to take uh, some mental adjustment too. And, uh, she visits these other factories and they're all employing women. All the men have gone to war. And, but 
that's not all. The women are doing all the jobs around town, but they're also, for the first time, being invited into universities. Women had gotten into universities, but it was often hard. And they were never in the hard sciences. They were never invited into sciences and engineering. Now they were not only allowed to come in, they were courted. They were recruited to come into these programs. For the first time, women were allowed to enter professional societies, engineering, astronomical societies. They had never been allowed in there before, but they needed women now, and so they were all taken in there. So Mabel Potter Daggett tells this story of how completely, and so now the story is not just that women were victims. No, we've gone beyond that. Women were active participants in the wars of poor men. Now it's a story about the empowerment of women. Let's jump ahead another year. <coughs> One of the biggest stories of the war, of course, was the Russian Revolution. And just a historic refresher course, there were two revolutions, two Russian revolutions in 1917. So depending which calendar you use, the first one was in February and it deposed the Tsar and it was a dramatic flowering. Uh, women got the vote in Russia before they did in the United States. And so a lot of reporters, a lot of women who were involved in various, reporting various progressive things, I mean, such as suffrage, but other progressive social causes too. A lot of women flocked over there. They wanted to write about this democratic renaissance in Russia. So they, these are, um, these women on the right, Bessie Beatty worked for the uh, San Francisco Chronicle. She was going around the world, writing about the world in uh, wartime, but ended up in Petrograd when the revolution started. This is uh, Louise Bryant. She was the wife of John Reed, you may have heard of. He wrote the famous account of the Russian Revolution, 10 Days That Shook the World. He's buried in the Kremlin. Um, but she went over there. She's a reporter in her own right. Rita Child Dorr was the first editor of the magazine The Suffragist, and, uh, but also a newspaper journalist. Uh, she goes over there, and she's one of the ones that covers most fully the biggest story for women reporters of, this of the summer, uh, the Women's Death Battalion. What happened over the summer in 1917 is that the Democrats quickly lost ground to the Bolsheviks. The Germans had sent, of course, Lenin over back to Russia. He had been in exile in Germany. And he starts stirring up the Bolsheviks, the communists, and they start fighting with the provisional democratic government. And they want to end the war. They want Russia to be out of the war. They want to sign a separate peace with Germany. And of course, this is the nightmare scenario for the Allied commanders. Because if Russia signs a separate peace with Germany, that means the 40 divisions that are on the Eastern Front can move to the Western <coughs> Front and confront the French and the other army that has just showed up in Europe, the American army. So they didn't want that to happen. So they were encouraged desertions. The, the Bolsheviks were encouraging soldiers to desert. They passed laws that soldiers could argue with their officers if they didn't like a command. It was a bad idea. Um, so the Russian army was falling apart. And at this time, this woman who had been in the army for a couple of years said, I'm going to form a battalion of women who will go where the men won't go. When the men desert, put us in the most dangerous spot. We'll fight to the death to hold this thing. They did. <laughs> Uh, well, they did it once. They advanced, captured a German trench, but the men wouldn't come up and support them. So they were cut to pieces and they had to withdraw. <coughs> and the big story of the war. Uh, and of course, and then in October, there was the Communist Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, and Russia did get taken out of the war. Um, so this was the other big story of the war. Oh, I, I should go back and... History is all about stories. Um, so I got to tell you this story about Rita Child Dorr. She goes back, after Russia, she goes back to the United States and she lectures about her war experience and what was happening in Russia. And she's talking to a big group of women in uh, New York City, uh, telling them about 
the women's death battalion and how these women rushed into the battle and the men wouldn't. And uh, there's an interruption and some man comes in and said, there's another group of, there's a group of men in the same building and they've been listening to a British officer tell about how heroic the British soldiers are. And it's really exciting. The, the women should really hear this story. And so the women say, okay, okay. They, they stop their program and this British officer comes in and tells them about the, how brave the British soldiers were. And when he's done, he says, but I, I have to tell you, ladies, that uh, men can't win the, this war by themselves. Women have an important role, too. Your job, ladies, is to smile. <laughs> Can you see the steam? Can you see the steam coming out of reading child doors? The way she put it, those. Uh, there sure was a lot of smiling when that dear, the door closed on that dear man. <laughs> uh, anyway, the other big story of 1917, of course, is that we got into the war. And the immediate question was, how are you going to cover American involvement in the war? America was involved in the war, was in the war for about a year before it entered combat. Um, it went in in April. Pershing, the commander, got over there in June. Uh, we, were, we started conscription here, the draft, and started recruiting men, training men here, sending them over there. We were building up the ports and the railroads and the warehouses, uh, sending our guys to train with the French, with the British. Uh, it was over a year before any of our soldiers saw combat. But how do you cover this? The American Expeditionary Forces, the AEF, decided they would only credential 15 reporters who would be allowed to travel with the Army. And they would be from the biggest urban newspapers and the big syndication services, and, and none of them were women. Uh, but you could still go over there. So a lot of women did. Um, the, um, <coughs> these are three, this is a woman who wrote for National Geographic. She's at the town of Reims, the famous Reims Cathedral where nearly every king of France had been crowned, had been destroyed by the Germans. So when anyone came to town, the French wanted to take them out there and show them that. Um, this, is, this is the same woman who was in that opening picture when I started my talk next to that naval mine. Uh, she was a photojournalist, did a lot of work on the Italian front. I think that's where she is here. Fortunately, her, her husband was also a photojournalist, so he took a lot of nifty pictures of her. And Peggy Hall, geez, I could talk a whole evening on Peggy Hall, too. Um, she was from the El Paso Sun. El Paso Sun had, had a 30,000 circulation. What was she doing over there? She was one of the very few women in the United States who actually had experience covering military matters because just the previous year, 1916, the American army had gone into Mexico during the Mexican Revolution to try to capture Pancho Villa, a, me a Mexican revolutionary. And uh, she was in El Paso. She was not allowed to cross into Mexico as the male journalists were, but she visited a lot of the training camps on the American side of the border and wrote about there in a real chatty, small town newspaper sort of way. It was interesting. She wasn't considered a very good journalist by most of her colleagues. Uh, but she, people enjoyed reading about this gossipy sort of stuff about the American soldiers there. So she did the same thing when she got to France. And uh, she was over there for a few months and couldn't, wanted to get credentialed and couldn't. And so uh, she came <coughs> home. Uh, so there were a lot of other women going over there. Uh, how would they get access to the war? They were not credentialed. Credential reporters were in a camp right near the front and periodically officers would guide them up to where their battle was taking place or allow them to visit other places, uh, the warehouses, the docks, the uh, training fields and stuff. Um, so if women couldn't get access that way, how were they going to get access to the war? How are they going to report the war? Uh, so this first one is Gertrude Atherton who wrote for the New York Times uh, talking about how she tried repeatedly you could go to the, German, uh, to the French war office and pre present your credentials, your letter from your editor, and uh, beg them, could I be taking on a tour up to the front? And if you ask very nice, or, or if you're from the New York Times, uh, they usually did eventually. It might take weeks or months. Uh, so they took her, never as close as she wanted to get, but they took her up there. For but 
that didn't always work. Uh, these two women were, well, here's Maul Radford Warren again, who went to Canada earlier. Um, these two women wrote for Saturday Evening Post. But the women reporters came up with a wonderful strategy. They volunteered with aid organizations. So some of them volunteered as uh, nursing assistants. Or Elizabeth Fraser uh, volunteered, she was a nurse and got to, was assigned to some of the very frontline hospitals and was really in the thick of a lot of the action. Uh, Mabel worked with the uh, YMCA Entertainment Unit. YMCA and the um, Salvation Army did a lot of work in support of the, the troops. And so she tells a wonderful story about moving up with a, a vaudeville troupe that was going to entertain the men and uh, every intersection there was a sentry trying to turn people back and she was always passed right through and the credentialed reporters, the men with the army, were stopped there and went, they couldn't go through and yet these women who were taking the vaudeville show to the troops at the front were waved on through, yeah, sure, go ahead. <laughs> and, and there were other women with uh, canteen units who were, were taking hot chocolate to the men in the troops and waved right through. And, and so these women got some better frontline uh, view of the action than a lot of the men. Um, Remember Rita Childor? She was the one that wrote about the death battalion <laughs> and was told to smile by the British officer. Um, she was back, after she was back in America for a while, she just wanted to go back and report on the war again. But the only thing she could think about now was her son. Her son Julian was now in the army. And so she wanted to go over there and r report for other mothers what was happening to their boys. And she goes over there. She wrote about 30 articles called a, Mo a Soldier's Mother in France, writing directly to other mothers back in America. <laughs> and this is her first one. And she finally, she met up with her son. The French had set up uh, a town, Aix les Bains, where American soldiers could go for R&R. &R. And uh, so she met up with her son there, and she wrote about it here. And this is the kind of reassurance that American mothers wanted. The red light district was closed. Free movies, wonderful food, no, no intoxicants. Plenty of nice girls, but no chance for mischief. Every American had shown himself a soldier and a gentleman. Quoted a French officer, behavior of American soldiers, a credit to the American mother. Talk about reassurance. This was a really popular feature and it was syndicated in a lot of newspapers and uh, very popular. Uh, okay, my last woman I want to talk about here, could spend the whole night on her too. She was probably the woman journalist who had the most military experience. She had covered the uh, Russo-Japanese War, 1904-1905. And then she married um, another journalist. They established the newspaper in Manila in the Philippines and uh, she reported for a lot of years in the South Pacific. Uh, when the war started, she started writing for, you guessed it, Saturday Evening Post. And over the course of four years of the war, you know, America was only in the war for, what, 18 months or so. She, but she reported for the whole duration from the start. And for a couple years afterward, when Europe was in chaos, um, she wrote 65 articles for the Saturday Evening Post. And wh what has always impressed me about her is that she went everywhere. A lot of the journalists would stay in pretty comfortable situation in Paris and then occasionally get taken out by French officers, escorted to the front, and then write about that. Oh, I was in the trenches. I heard the sound of the guns. Uh, she went everywhere. So she went, early on she went to Serbia. Here's the American victory in Serbia. That wasn't a military victory. Serbia was fighting cholera and American doctors are over there trying to help them and uh, they succeeded. Uh, she was on a, a ship in the Mediterranean when it was attacked by an Austrian submarine and ended up in a lifeboat and they're pulling drowned victims and dumping them in her lap. <laughs> uh, incredible. She, um, are there any Turks in the audience? Uh, Turkey was exterminating its Armenian population at this time and uh, People warned her not to go, don't go into Armenia. It'll scar you for life, what you see. 
So where does she go? Armenia. Um, so she goes there and it, it's as bad as I said. I mean, the Turks were sending them on a resettlement program, they call them, but they would send them into the interior with no accommodations. I mean, hundreds of miles trip, no food along the way, no water, no consequences if anyone wanted to <laughs> rob, rape, or kill them. Uh, didn't matter. And consequently, millions died. Uh, so she saw this and wrote about it had to smuggle her notes out at the risk of her life. Um, she was over in Mesopotamia. No one was writing Mesopotamia. The British were fighting Mesopotamia, what is now Iraq, Iran. Oops, whoops, I jumped ahead. Um, she was over there when uh, the British general was poisoned. She was with him that night. So, I mean, incredible uh, war experience. So let me wrap up here with three takeaways about women journalists in the war. <coughs> Face greater challenges and develop strategies to overcome them. These are actual quotes here that some of the women journalists heard from the French. We can't send a woman into danger. Why didn't your newspaper send a man? Uh, so they volunteered with aid or organizations and got access to the front. Uh, they went to cover the woman's angle on the war and they really developed that and impressed upon the American public what a vital role women were playing there. And especially after America became involved, uh, this became such an important issue. How were American women supposed to act now that their country was in the war as well? And, and then there's, here's this hard to define thing, that there was something fundamentally different in the way women report war than men. And this, this is a little hard to put your finger on here. Um, I think it's in part because they often put themselves in more nurturing, supportive roles. So they were nurses in hospitals. They would see soldiers in the cafes and translate the menus for them. Um, I have one story I want to tell you. I, I swore I wouldn't tell you this because I, I could hardly tell it without choking up. Fortunately, <coughs> I, br I brought a tissue just in case. So. But uh, the kind of examples of how the women personalize some of these stories. So there was a woman, um, Clara Savage, who wrote for Good Housekeeping Magazine, who was reporting the war. Good Housekeeping Magazine sent a war reporter over there. And boy, did she catch it for that. She would go up to the French and say, uh, would you uh, take me on an escorted tour of the French? Oh, uh, sure, what, what publication you work for? Good Housekeeping. <laughs> <You know? laughs> They'd scratch their head. Do we, really, do we really need to waste our time uh, and endanger ourselves taking a reporter from Good Housekeeping magazine to that. I don't think so. But she wrote, has a wonderful story here, and I'll, I'll end with this. Um, she's in a hospital and sees an American soldier there whose arm is in a sli uh, cast and his head is all bandaged up. And he says, I, I want to write a letter to my girlfriend back home. Would you, if I dictate it, would you write it down for me? Oh, sure, sure, yeah, sure. <coughs> so he starts writing this down. I'll have to summarize this quickly or, or I'll break up, I know. Uh, he, as she says, he starts off telling uh, her everything a, a woman wants to hear from the man she loves. That he loves her and he misses her and he can't wait to be back home and take her in his arms. So it starts off good. Then he pauses and says, yeah, I want to tell her one other thing, but I, I can't find the words. You know, you're a journalist. Maybe you can help me find the words to tell her this. And she said, well, okay, I'll try. What do you want to tell her? I, I want to tell her that, see here it's coming. <laughs> I want to tell her that I lost an eye and my face is horribly mangled. So how do I tell her that? Can she still love a man like that? So anyway, she writes that letter for him. She assures him that oh, his girlfriend still love him. And uh, she writes a letter. And, but that's an example for me of the kind of personal emotional touch that you almost never see with a male correspondent in the war. So I will end there. And uh, I think we have time for a few questions, if you have any questions. About I know I knocked the emotional juice out of you. <laughs>
it back over. Do a lot of these female journalists enjoy a post-war popularity, or do a lot of them do the women's thing? <laughs> Well, you're right. A lot of the women who had stepped into the male jobs did lose a lot of them when the men came back. Um, but it, I think it's true, too, and, and it, it held for journalists that women, I mean, if you remember that one quote from here, that the woman, uh, Daggett, who says, nothing you ever heard about women before 1914 is the same after 1914. Yes. Everything changed, and women were not going to go back to the same thing. Well, of course, 1920, they, they got the vote. Um, but um, so it was changed. I, I mean, I wouldn't have statistics on how many of them stayed in their jobs. Um, but women were <coughs> the first women's professional journalistic society started just before the war. Uh, but it, it, it was growing, and women were getting more uh, <coughs> roles in journalism and bigger newspapers and things, too. Yeah. Like I learned in college meant 40 years ago, the sexual revolution actually began when World War I ended, not in the 1960s as many people. Absolutely, think. yeah. Yes. Right, it began in the war. Did any of them get wounded or captured over there? Uh, well, not very many journalists died. One went down on the Lusitania that was torpedoed by a German submarine. The most famous male journalist who got injured um, charged with the Marines in Bellow Wood and lost his <coughs> eye, took three bullets, one to, his arm, one to each arm and one to his eye. He survived. The one woman journalist who got injured um, was being taken on a tour of only women journalists and being guided by a French officer and, and a, a French woman. And they were taken to a battlefield that had recently seen action. And the French officer warned them, don't pick up anything. This field hasn't been cleared yet. And, but everyone wanted a souvenir, of course. So one of the women picked up a, a German Bible and, and took that as a souvenir. And the French woman picked up, she thought it was a gas mask. It was a hand grenade. <laughs> and it went off. It killed the... It killed that woman immediately. It blew the arm off the French officer. And one of the women who was standing close by was severely injured in her legs. She spent nearly six months in the American hospital in Paris, uh, past the end of the war, and, and wrote about it. So, um, but those were, that's the only ones that I know about that were injured. Or no, no women journalists were killed in the war. Well, thank you very much. You were wonderful guinea pigs.